So thank you very much for that introduction and thank you all for inviting me. Thanks especially uh, to Bernie Riley and it's an honor to be here um, at this organization and especially to be here um, at this transition moment in this organization. So thank you so much for including me. Um, this is a, um, it's a fun topic. I have to say, having just listened um, to Alondra Nelson, I'm, I, I wanna like throw away my slides and just answer the thing like, so, Know, to respond to things that she said, but I, I, I will not do that. Um, but I might try and sneak some of them in as we go. Um, I'm gonna talk, when we talk about, uh, about private data, there are a lot of different things that we can mean um, by private data and the privatization of data, and I will try to address several of those meanings as we go forward. Um, so in some ways, actually thinking about private data, I started thinking this is actually, there's a tension right now we also constantly hearing about open data and open science, and at the same time, we're talking a lot about private data. So there's a big push for open data. There's a big push for open science. I um, I just came yesterday. I was at you know something on transparency and reproducibility in federal statistics um, at the National Academies. There's something like this on a regular basis. So there's oh, this big push for open data and open science. At the same time, we see, and you, I'm sure you all see this as you work with researchers looking for data, there's a big increase in the research use of private data, private in many different meanings. So why are these seemingly contradictory trends occurring at the same time? Well, one possibility is that one is actually causing the other, right? That in fact, it is the increasing use of private data that others cannot get that has created the demand for open science and open data. Um, that's probably a little bit of the story, but I actually think it's not much of the story because I think even before when people were using what were more public data sources for their research, that they were not engaged in what we would call open science and open data practices for lots of other reasons, um, many of which I'll talk about, but I bet we all, what you also know. Um, so another reason that, um, that we see both of these things going on simultaneously is that they're actually talking about somewhat different things. So um, when we think about, um, and, and particularly when we talk about private, we can mean lots of different things. We can mean private as in my personal, sensitive, confidential information about me, right? We can also mean um, that it's private in the sense that I own it, right? And those are, and it, those may be the same thing or they may actually be very different things. And in fact, part of the tension that we see today is that there is some private sensitive information about me that maybe somebody else thinks that they own, right? And that's why we have, you know, that's what the GDPR is supposed to try to shift that balance in terms of who controls that, the, that GDPR is the general privacy data protection. I'm sure I'm getting a um, regulation um, from the European Commission. I'm sure I, I had some letters wrong in there, but it's, um, <laughs> uh, but if, since I'm from an organization called ICPSR, which nobody ever, ever gets those letters right, not even my family, um, uh, I keep trying to say we should just change our name to the data consortium, um, but I haven't gotten the consortium to sign off on that yet. But now that I hear we, we, we can think about how to manage consortiums, I have to work on that part. Uh, um, I, maybe I'll get that. Um, but um, uh, where was I anyway? <laughs> um, uh, so, so we have different meanings um, for private. We can also have different meanings for open. When people talk about what it means for data to be open or for science to be open, they can mean very different things. One is that it can mean without any monetary cost, right? That it's free. And I don't know how often um, people, sort of strangers try to walk into your libraries and take things off of the shelves. I actually remember going and working um, at Widener Library when I was in middle school and they were not accustomed to having children walk in and demand um, to ha access their resources, but I felt quite, uh, Cambridge does that, it makes you feel entitled. So, uh, so I felt quite entitled to do that and quite, anyway, um, so, 
Um, but in fact, having things that can be public and open um, is can, does not mean that they are without cost or that, that anybody can get access to them. Um, sometimes, right, it can mean that it's in a public library where anyone can get access and sometimes there is more exclusion. There's some definition of who can get access even to something which might be open. Open can also mean that there are transparent rules by which one gets access to data. Okay, and we're going to come back to that. And open, but and finally, open can mean that there are non-proprietary tools for reading the data. And we'll actually see that that's that is what is in the legislation that was just passed by Congress. So I'll come back to that. So. Um, so we have these contradictory trends in part because we're, we're talking sometimes about different things. And if we can define them, maybe we'll even be able to get rid of some false dichotomies and think about ways that we can both protect privacy without necessarily impeding research, um, in, um, improving um, open science, improving transparency and reproducibility in science without um, uh, imposing costs on researchers or individual um, study participants. Um, uh, what I'm going to try to talk about some today are approaches that support goals that are about increasing the creation of new knowledge. And I think that's really what, we, what we're talking about when we talk about open science and open data is how do we set rules that allow for the incremental creation of new knowledge at the same time that we respect, and here I, I kept changing my phrase, and I just finally meant, I, we mean human rights, right? People's ability to, um, to participate in research endeavors and also to limit um, the, in, uh, the, the imposition of others on their, uh, on their own private information. So open data, I don't know um, how much of you have, um, how much of this will be familiar to all of you, but if I think about the open data movement in the United States, at least, I think people often start off by talking about, um, and that the, the 2013, they should say, Office of Science and Technology Policy Memorandum, which called for open access to data. And that is probably when you first started seeing researchers come in and say, I have some mandate from some funder that requires that I share my data, because they started talking about that in 2013. Um, in 2018, actually the beginning of 2019, something called the Foundations for Evidence-Based Policymaking Act was passed. And Section 2 of that act is the Open Data Act. So again, I don't know um, whether you hear about, some of you probably hear about these things every day, and some of you this may seem a, a mystery. But the Foundations of Evidence-Based Policy Act encourages agencies to, that is say federal agencies, to inventory all of their data resources, to think about their data resources um, as assets, and to make public an inventory of what those data resources are, and to commit to making those, that, those data available for evidence-based policy making. Now, that does not include, as Alondra said, analysis of data for the creation of knowledge and understanding of human society, right? It is knowledge for a very specific purpose, improving policy. Um, but it is, but, but it's a pretty, but that's a pretty broad, it's a still a pretty broad category and it's a still a pretty big commitment on the part of the, well, commitment might be a strong word. It's legislation <laughs> um, on the part of the federal government um, in support of making data open, right? So we're talking about data becoming more private. This is a big push toward making data open. Um, just so that you know, this didn't, of course, really start in 2013. This is my little, for those, a little plug, for those of you who don't know what ICPSR is, it was founded in 1962 to provide access to data. And it was a, it was a, it was not an open data as in throw it up on the web, which obviously did not exist in 1962. Um, it, but it was transformative in how academics thought about access to data. So the researchers at the University of Michigan Political Science Department who started the American National Election Study did something very different than what researchers had previously done. Instead of 
doing a survey and then keeping it for themselves and, and making sure that they got the most publications out of it and nobody else got to it or nobody else could, could check what they'd done or get to it. They could only get to it five years later, they, right? Instead, what they did was to try to make it available as quickly as possible to 22 members of the, of the consortium that became ICPSR, um, and those were universities, um, all of which I'm sure are members of, um, of CRL. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm absolutely sure they are. Um, uh, um, those 22 con members of the consortium, have, ICPSR has now grown. We're now almost 800 um, universities and research institutions are members of the consortium. I, I would be very surprised if there's anybody in this room who's not a member of the ICPSR consortium. Um, and But what the ICPSR was founded to make um, data available to members of the consortium who contributed not again not to any you know 12 year old who walks in off the street but to anyone um, who is part of the consortium to make data accessible to everyone on those on equal on equal and transparent terms and at the same time also to provide training which ICPSR does in social science methodology because one of the things that we often say is access to data is not really access if you can't analyze it, if you don't have the tools, if you don't have the skills to analyze the data in a way that allows you to engage in, in, in discussions and debate, then, you, then it's not really access. So the training in, is, part, is actually a critical part of the access. Um, so ICPSR is now, um, as I said, we have about 800 um, consortium members. We have over 10,000 studies um, over, you know, with millions of data files and over 250,000 users per year. I actually, I, I, I don't, I don't, I think it got taken off of the slide, but we also just received last week um, the National Medal from the, for Museum and Library Service, and I think we are the first data archive ever to receive a National Medal um, for, um, for library service. So we are this data organization, a data archive that is now functioning um, and is an important part of the library um, ecosystem. Okay. All right. So why open data? Right. Um, so, it, so I've talked a lot. I'm going to talk more about privacy. But first, why is open data so important? Well, open data is important. I would say for three basic reasons. First of all, data is power. Right. Um, in this, you know, it's, data is the oil, as people often say, of the tw you know of the 21st century economy. Access to data is critical, not just for knowledge building. It is it is critical to the function of democracy. Right. Second. Data is costly to produce, but, but a lot of that is fixed costs, right? So that is to say, we, and we spend billions of dollars every year, not just Google and Facebook, but, but the federal government and research institutions spend billions of dollars every year producing data and making, and in order, and we can leverage that investment in data by making it available. Access to data is efficient in the sense that we should not have to reinvent, remeasure things over and over and over again. And in fact, this is for people in the in the data production world, the survey methodology world. This is extremely important. How many of you want to answer a survey on your phone when you get home tomorrow? <laughs> right? Nobody does. You you do not take those calls anymore. Doing these things. I mean, and and and, and this makes it extremely difficult and costly to do things like the census and all of the surveys that the Census Bureau does and the other agencies do. So trying to minimize the, what we ask of researchers by increasing access um, is, is actually critically important to having good data in the future. Finally, um, as, I, as I think was probably clear from what I said before, and as I think what most researchers think about when they think about why open data, is that data, having access to data is necessary for reproducibility, for the reproducibility and knowledge building. Um, um, so if, we, if you 
do what you think of as science and other people can't look at the underlying data, your act, it's not science, right? You can't build on it, other people can't verify it. Um, it undermines the legitimacy, um, as Alondra was saying, of science when there isn't access. It's like, oh, well, you say that, but I can say anything I want because you're keeping to yourself, as academic researchers often have, the, um, the underlying data. So access to data is critical to something, to research actually being science. Um, so, but that's the open side. We are increasingly also talking about private data and data privacy. And this is because researchers increasingly make use of private data, right? They, um, private, either private because it belongs to a company, right, that, uh, that asserts control over it, or private because it contains individuals, that, uh, in information about individuals that they may not want to be um, public. And just as an example, um, uh, the American Economics Association, over a decade ago, started requiring of all author, authors who publish in its journals, which are the like top six journals in economics, um, it, it required that they share their data and their code to be published in these in the top economics journals. Okay, um, and they. Uh, and they did what they thought of as best practices at the time, which was to take the data and, the, and code and stick them up on their website. About a third of all of the articles that are accepted for publication, which have empirical analysis, actually requested a waiver and were given a waiver from this exemption, right, from this policy because, right, they said the data belonged to somebody else. They got it from a company and the company won't let me give it to you, right? The, I, or the data contains confidential information and so I can't give it to you to just put it up on your website or some combination of the two, right? Sometimes the data is confidential data in the federal government and there are there laws that, that regulate it. Sometimes it's private companies. Sometimes it's sensitive. But the combination of these things became the reason or the excuse, depending on your perspective, for researchers not to comply with this policy. And I, I think the answer actually is that it's both the reason and the excuse. It's both of them. And not, and, and um, so we've had to, um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make two computers work at the same time here. This is not working. Uh, I've gotten spoiled with having two screens, you know? <laughs> Um, so, uh, so, so, the, so as a result, um, the, the American Economics Association has now actually come to ICPSR and they've set up a repository at ICPSR where, um, and where researchers put their data. This actually improves on the, on the past practice because we don't have fragments of data. Um, and which is what you got before that had no provenance. They were just sort of like, these are the three, you know, these are the three variables that I used for this article. All right, who knows where they came from? So now what we'll have is better provenance for the data. We'll have it um, linked to the code. Um, and, and because it will come to ICPSR, we actually have, as I'm going to talk about, a whole suite of tools that make it possible to manage access to private data private in all of these senses, okay? So, all right. So there is, um, an, so, so I just told you that there's, there are journals and, and researchers who are using private data and that is create, that creates, if you like, a crisis for transparency and open data. At the same time, for those of you who follow what's been going on with the Census Bureau and access to the Census Bureau data, there is increasing concern that they should make things more private, that is in more closed, because of concern. Again, as, as, uh, as Alondra said, that you cannot truly anonymize data. That the Census Bureau, the Census Bureau has led statistical agencies around the world, modeled for statistical agencies around the world, public sharing access to data. So we have a lot of information that is made publicly available from the different surveys and censuses that the federal statistical agencies um, collect. And they anonymize it so 
um, that you know when you answer the census that nobody can see that data, right? That nobody can see anything about your household or your business, right? That you, you're there, your information is provided to them and becomes part of the statistical picture of the country but does not reveal anything about your household, right? Or you as an individual or your business to the rest of the world. That has become very difficult. That promise um, of, com uh, of anonymization has become much more difficult to maintain um, as we have more information out there in the world about households and as computational power has increased. So it used to be that, you know, you have a survey that you take, you know, so, so for the, the Census Bureau, for example, has, does a survey, a long-form survey that, that what used to do a long-form survey that covered 15% of the population. You think 15% of the population, the whole country, it's a, you can, you, and you take, say, let's say you take, five, you know, a third of those people and you make those available to the world, you can't possibly figure out who that is as long as you don't, if you don't tell me where they live, there are a lot of households. We've got a lot of households in the United States, right? But if you, if you know enough about all of the households, say, maybe not in Chicago, but in Montana, or in, a, you know, or in commuting distance to Chicago, but not living in Illinois, right, which is a really interesting th question, right, you can easily start to narrow things down. There are a lot of other public data resources, and with, a, with, and with enough compute power, it becomes possible to re-identify these things. Um, this has, um, yes, so I have this. So this has, um, I, this idea has been captured in what is called the database reconstruction theorem, which is a mathematical proof that says with enough information, you can reconstruct the original database and all of the individuals in that original data set so all of the original respondents to a survey or to a census, if you have enough information, um, if you have enough different cross tabs of that information, you can reconstruct those things with, certain, with, a, with a certain amount of uncertainty, with a certain probability. Um, and the census is very concerned that because they produce so much information from the census that they do, that they've increased um, the light that they've made it too easy to re-identify people. Um, the citizenship question, um, which has been added, um, or which is proposed to be added, we have we have a passive tense there, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, is proposed to be added to uh, uh, to the 2020 census. Actually, makes this a much more serious problem because the questions that are on the decennial census are actually not very sensitive. They're like, how many people live in your household and, you know, and how old are they? Asking whether or not they are citizens of the United States is actually a much more sensitive question the, the, um, and threatens um, and, and both makes it more uh, challenging um, to try to protect the census. It makes it more challenging, obviously, to get people to answer the census, but that's a, that's a separate an important but separate question. Um, so the Census Bureau has been um, under, is, is, it is, let us say, strongly considering severely restricting what it makes available to the general public from the surveys and the censuses that it does and is turning to what it calls modern privacy protection mechanisms to try to produce data products that will be, um, uh, that will satisfy the use cases while still um, uh, protecting people's uh, confidentiality. Um, a, a couple things I would say about this. One is that, um, and this is, this is a general statement about data, which is that data that is locked up um, is very safe and has no utility, <laughs> right? <laughs> so the, the question here is how we balance those two things. And actually, this gets to the question we had about in teaching. Um, 
that we need to we need to articulate and the census bureau and the federal statistical system need to articulate the different use cases for data and sort of how much privacy is necessary to protect and how much openness is necessary to, to satisfy those use cases. So for example, the single most important, I mean the, the most important users of the Census Bureau data are not researchers, right? They're not faculty, they're not graduate students. They are um, county planning agencies, right? Who use, who need public use data products uh, for certain, for, and, and that's sort of a whole class of use cases that needs to be articulated. Within the academy, the single most important, most the, the modal user, the single most common user of these data is again, is not faculty, it is not graduate students, it is undergraduates. Undergraduates use a lot of data to learn about how to do, become data scientists, to learn how to do data analysis. They use it to write their undergraduate papers. They actually can have pretty low quality data and it won't, it won't actually, <laughs> they can learn a lot about how to analyze data without, um, but using data that I would say is low quality in the sense that we have, as we say, infused statistical noise into the data. It's not, there's some uncertainty about how accurate the data are, the, um, and that creates, and that protects privacy. That's one way to pr create privacy. Um, and that's not a very useful way to do things. Oh, oh okay, see, I, all right, I'll keep going, okay. Uh -huh. um, Jason's not here, right? Okay, I will, uh, so, um, uh, okay, um, so, th so there are different ways to protect privacy. Um, there, there, ha there are some long-standing arrangements um, that we use to providing access to confidential data. So the census does things to make data, make data safe and public. Um, in the past, it has done that by suppressing certain information, particularly it's information about geography, inform and um, it swaps people, it swaps households, it messes with the data, right, in certain ways, and it keeps those, those um, ways secret in order to protect confidentiality. Another, an alternative is to make um, very transparent what it's doing and to do, but to use it, use, um, a statistical approach which is literally adding statistical noise to what you see. That is, in case you, that is what is on the table, that is what the Census Bureau is planning to do with its public use data products going forward. Um, certainly for the 2020 decennial census and after that with other project products. For the research community, what this means is that we need to think about how you provide access to confidential data, data that is not safe, right? The data that is private, it has, it is potentially, and in fact, you know, quite easily in some level with enough compute power re-identifiable. The way that we protect data, the way that we protect private data, data about private people, is involves both a technological and a social component. People often think that this is a technological, they are looking for a technological solution, and that is completely and utterly false, right? The technological stuff is, is, is the easy part. It's always the easy part. Um, ICPSR has for a long time made available confidential data. Some of your libraries probably have had to think about this in working with us around data use agreements that we write, make researchers sign. We enumerate the researchers' responsibilities and the institution's responsibilities, the consequences if they don't follow them. And we used to send out encrypted CDs. We don't do that anymore. Now we have encrypted download. And, and, the, and in this case, each of the researchers responsible for making sure that what they um, share with the rest of the world in their research um, analysis does not violate the, the privacy terms under which they got the data. There are also physical enclaves which now exist all across the country. Um, probably most of your universities have physical enclaves where people go into a locked room in order to analyze data. Again, these have a controlled computing environment, so there's a different technological solution, but they also will have a data use agreement. They'll probably have, they may have somebody else, what we call third-party disclosure view. Somebody else checks to make sure that what comes out of that room is safe. Oops, wrong page, okay. 
All right. There are emerging arrangements for accessing confidential data that are going to become more important as people, because people are more interested in accessing private data, right? People, are, it may be becoming private because the federal government thinks it's not, has decided that it's not safe. It may be that it's private because it belongs to a company. I, I'm pretty sure that this is what, um, if Jason were here, he would tell you that I, I'm pretty sure this is what um, they're doing with the uh, access to Facebook data um, in the uh, in the Research One Enterprise. So the so and those are building virtual data enclaves. So again, you're going to have a, re a data use agreement. We're introducing something called a researcher passport, which is a digital credential that identifies a researcher as having a certain level of understanding and experience in. Um, in managing confidential data with the idea that um, researchers who are, um, have, they, that you, you want to sort of match the, technolo the technology, um, how safe that is, the data, how safe that is, how private it is, and, and the researcher, how safe they are. So that's what the researcher passport is. We also are in, um, see increasing use of secure online computing, and I am not going to talk about that because I'm running out of time. So I have a bunch of slides here that are about the researcher passport um, that I'm just going to go through quickly. The researcher passport, the idea is that you give passports to safe people as in the sense of safe researchers who have verified identities. They have an institutional affiliation, an institution that's willing to sort of vouch for them and punish them if they violate the rules that they have participated in some kind of training, and there's a record of their experience with data. And then visas are issued by um, data holders who have private data to in, facilitate access. Okay, um, I'm gonna keep going. I think this is, so this is, so this is, this is RADIUS, which is ICPSR's new researcher access data system, and you sign on to your regular ICPSR account just like that, and then you see it has a, can you see the researcher passport is right there. You sign into that, and you see where it says apply now. You click apply now. You give us some information about who you are, and you are basically agreeing to share information about you with someone so that you can get access to private data, either private data held at ICPSR or someplace else, okay? Um, the other, I think it's about to show this, the, the other, this, the other thing we're doing is the slide that I skip, which is an online data access system where you can analyze data that you can't actually see, that you, you submit queries, you submit code, and you don't actually see this. That's um, what we, uh, that's called StatSnap. So, it, um, all right, I'm going to skip all of this. Uh, um, so what we're talking about are building models of access to private data, okay? Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, all right, I will. Um, I'm, I'm going to, um, you can, and I t I've talked about there being credentialed researchers, researchers who um, have established their own trustworthiness at some level. We've talked about privacy protecting technologies, using noise infusion, using a virtual data enclave. But obviously the critical question is you need cooperation from data custodians. I've talked some already about the public sector that provides access to confidential data, to restricted data that's private in some sense, and how there are steps, including the Foundations Act, including um, the creation of the Federal um, Statistical um, Research Data Center Network, the FSRDCs, used to belong just to the Census Bureau, and now they are run by the statistical system as a whole. Um, and so, there's, so there's, there is movement um, to provide transparent access, but in a controlled way, to confidential data. Obviously, when you turn to the private sector, um, what you see is something which is more heterogeneous, let us say. So we actually just did, we we're actually, I just did a survey um, with um, Catherine Abraham and Matthew Shapiro of people who are using commercial data, data from companies in their research. 
Um, and what we looked, and we asked them a whole bunch of questions about how they got their data, the terms under which they got their data, what they were allowed to tell us. And um, actually, as Alondra talked about, there are very different kinds of people. Some of them, sometimes people got data, commercial data, because they, like, they just stole it, right? They scraped it from the web. They violated terms of service, and they said, you know what? This is for a public purpose, and I don't care. Come after me, right? Um, uh, sometimes they got things by um, having collaborative arrangements with companies. Some of those are things like social media companies. Um, some of them are companies that engage in transactions and they have the data about those transactions and they were willing to give those to researchers under certain terms. And others of them are, are companies for whom selling data is their business, right? They're aggregating transactions from other companies they're co or, or, or they're uh, or they're providing a platform in which people are giving them lots of information like social media companies and then they sell that information in one way or another. So people will get to all of these kinds of companies are in fact right now providing data to researchers which they hope to publish as social science through a peer reviewed process, right? Um, oops, wrong slide, okay. So one of the things we asked them was how much did you pay for the data? If you got, did, did you pay the company uh, for the data, and the answer was, we can't tell you. It's a secret, right? Um, uh, uh, we asked them, are you allowed to share the data? So the answer is most, in most cases, no, right? Um, uh, most, in most cases, they don't even allow you um, to t say uh, the, what, the, what the agreement is. You're not allowed to, you're not allowed to share the data. Um, you're not allowed to um, post the data publicly. You're not allowed to put the data someplace else where people could um, access it confidentially. Um, you're not allowed to share the terms under which you got the data. Um, but they said, yeah, anybody else who happened to, you know, anyway. Uh, um, but, but somebody else could, in fact, get, if you happen to know the right, have the right relationship with the company, you could, in fact, get access to the data. I mean, this is one of the challenges with these kinds of arrangements is who gets access is, is not random. Okay. We also asked them about archiving data. Are these things going to be preserved? And what was amazing was how many authors said, oh, yeah, the data are preserved. The data are being archived. They are being archived either by the provider. I, I don't know how to tell. You know this, right? I mean, these researchers really thought that these companies, what, they're, they're, keeping a snapshot, a version, carefully versioned snapshot of the data that they gave to you, for you like that's not true, right? But they believe, but, but it seemed good to believe it. And it's also, I mean, actually oftentimes they thought that the, a government agency would be archiving data, they're not, right? So, so generally these data are not archived and the users are not actually permitted to archive them. Um, there is, um, yes, okay, we'll skip that, all right. So there are reasons, like com com these companies, these are all examples of companies that were actively engaging with researchers to facilitate economic research, right? This was not, I mean, all of these companies are, most of these companies actually um, do in fact employ economists. Um, Amazon is the largest employer of economists, um, the largest um, hire of economists um, every year in the, uh, in the job market. PhD economists, the single largest employer of new PhDs every year for the last several years has been Amazon, right? Um, and um, so they, they have economists on their own. That they don't, they're not sharing the data because they can't employ um, uh, economists. Microsoft has economists. Google has, right? I mean, they all have, right? They do this. Um, so, um, they're, so, they're, so why are they doing this? It does, um, sharing data does require time and resources on the part of the companies, right? The information has business value and in some cases they really would prefer to sell or monetize their data, right? It has disclosure risk. There's a risk both about personal, personal information that's in here um, and there's also information about the company that's, that might be in there. There's information that might actually, that maybe they're supposed to, you know, that if, if some researcher figures it out, they're going to go to the SEC and say, you know, like this is, this is actually has implications um, in the financial market um, to, for the future of the company. So they have, so there are some real risks, right? There's also um, concern that data will be used for regulation or enforcement um, and companies um, might, not, might not want that. 
Um, they also, and, and I've, I've often had companies just say, you know, I get, we get too many requests, I, we don't want to deal with one more. Um, but the flip side of that is, um, uh, is that firms are not monolithic. The, in fact, because these a lot of these information technology companies, a lot of large companies, they hire academic, hire PhD social scientists who want to engage with the social science community. And this actually, so for them, this is actually a way to participate. And you see this if you look, for example, at the history of the chemical industry in the United States. Um, you can see that chemists who worked for large chemical companies wanted to participate in their professional associations and there's tension. You see this among engineers. I mean, if you look at the history of science in this country, there's always this tension between scientists who go in and work for companies. I'm way, uh, all right, I'll, okay, I'll stop. See, I, yeah, okay, so, uh, okay. So solutions, there are some solutions um, they that to make it easier for, um, and make it more likely that this data, which is valuable to social science researchers, actually become accessible to them. These include things like creating templates and standards for agreements for data and metadata. Um, uh, in fact, just um, uh, for uh, and to sort of reduce the burden uh, on companies um, by making it easier to do this. And in fact, by, again, by uh, echoing something else that Alondra said, which is using trusted intermediaries, um, uh, third-party intermediaries, to sort of manage the risks and the burden that companies sometimes face um, when, they, uh, when they share data. And I'm gonna skip, I was gonna tell you about some things that we do um, in that trusted intermediary space, but I wanna just end instead um, by, by saying that, um, that about something about how I think all of you um, in your research libraries can, can think about this. And that is um, that, um, that we want to think about building data communities by um, creating access to data, by creating communities of researchers who are uh, engaging in shared problems. And that's, actually, that's something which has to happen across libraries, across institutions, across disciplines, and across organizational types. So engaging companies that have data in those kinds of, um, in, in that research ecosystem, if you like, helps to create a, a community in which it, it, is, it is possible to make the case that there should be access for scientific research. All right, I was gonna, uh, I will, Stop there. <laughs>